When I was uh, asked to speak at this event, I thought, gosh, uh, well, I've studied, I've studied and, and written about religious freedom for many years, and as a historian, thought about war for many years. But I'd never quite approached the issue in this way. What's the effect of war on religious freedom? And my initial impulse was precisely what Rod Dreher just said, and I think it is substantially true. War is a terrible thing for religion and for religious freedom. And he's given, as far as I'm concerned, the best case study for it, and that is the devastating impact of World War I on religious communities, on uh, Islamic communities in the Middle East, Christianity in the Middle East. This began the decline of Christianity, which we are seeing today in the Middle East. Uh, I think George Weigel's phrase is the crisis of civilizational morale that came out of the First World War. It was a, a terrible thing for many, many things, including religion and religious freedom. But as I began to think about it, uh, as usual, there are some complexities here that I think are interesting, uh, and I would like to explore briefly with you in touching on four wars and maybe focusing uh, on one of them. The Second World War, uh, on its surface, seems to be precisely uh, following the pattern of World War I. That is to say, it was, it was a war against the Jews, a war against Judaism, an attempt to destroy Judaism, and indeed, as a totalitarian impulse, an attempt to destroy religion uh, altogether. Not simply in Europe, but there's no doubt, had Hitler and the Third Reich uh, prevailed, all freedoms would have been destroyed, uh, including religious freedom. So uh, another way to think of the war, of course, is the Allied resistance to Hitler, which was the war to preserve these freedoms, including religious liberty. You may recall the four freedoms articulated by uh, President Roosevelt as reasons for the United States getting into the war, which he in, in which he included religious freedom. So had we not won this war, you might call it a defensive war in this sense, the, our freedoms would have been destroyed. So that's a let me call that a simple complexifying of this issue. I don't like that phrase, complexifying, but maybe it fits well here. Another war that seems to be quite uh, straightforward in this respect is uh, the so-called wars of religion in the 16th and 17th century in Europe. Following on the Reformation, the savaging of each other by Protestants and, and Catholics and of minority religions, uh, not the least of whom were the Anabaptists, uh, really by both sides. Um, the reason I mention this is not to suggest that religious freedom came out of this, but to, pro to point out that many in the West believe religious freedom came out of these wars of religion. Uh, the, a standard narrative is that the Peace of Westphalia of 1648, which ended this and the Thirty Years' War, uh, began national sovereignty, which is of course true, and the subordination of religion to the state, which to a certain extent is true. These Erastian uh, states such as England and France, Protestant and Catholic respectively, uh, subordinated the major religion. It was the religion of the, of the king. Um, and so goes the narrative today. This was the beginning of religious tolerance because it, it was the removal of religion from public life uh, based on the premise that if you don't do that, then religion will inevitably lead to conflict and war. I think this is a huge mistake, which leads me to my third war that I want to pause on for a minute, and that is the war for American independence, which I think laid the groundwork for the true understanding of religious freedom uh, which is not the privatization of, privatization of religion, the removal of religion from public life, but the establishment of a state in which religion is welcomed, indeed urged into public life on the basis of full equality. Now, most people don't think uh, of the American Revolution as a religion-oriented kind of war, but I think this is a mistake. If you've read uh, about the American Revolution, of course you know about the opposition uh, to taxes. Some things never change. Confiscatory taxation by the British Crown uh, was uh, debilitating in the 18th century just as it's no longer the British Crown, but we still have the problem of taxation today. And this was a major, major cause of the war. But perhaps less emphasized, I want to emphasize here, is the powerful religious impulse behind 
many of the soldiers, the generals, the policies that were involved in resisting the British crown, particularly among Protestant dissenting uh, sects, the, the, uh, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Baptists, and the like. Now, of course, Americans at the time, just like they are now, were divided over that war. The Quakers and uh, the, the descendants of the Anabaptists that were here at the time tended to a pacifist approach to the war. And then, of course, there was the Church of England itself, which was mainly in the South, which is where I'm from, in the Carolinas and uh, Georgia. Uh, many of those who supported the English crown were members of the Church of England in the South, but they were divided. It was this Protestant dissenting sect fervor, which was very much present in the armies, in the way that they prayed before battle. Uh, read George Washington's uh, recounting of, of, of the prayers that he prescribed before battle. Read the two volumes of Ellis Sandoz. I think it's entitled Political Sermons of the Founding Era. Just full of this fervor which I would characterize as kind of a Protestant individualist understanding of religion. This carried over after the war was over into the construction of our First Amendment. So in this sense, and please don't hear me as saying this was a war for religious freedom, it's more complicated than that, but this is an aspect of the American Revolution that I think is rarely emphasized, and I think it's important. This Protestant individualism, this sense that God, we must respond to him, that if we respond properly, he will be on our side, is of course the seedbed of some very problematic policies that are still with us today. But it is what it is, and indeed I think it was this fervor that led to the content of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now just one, and I'll go to my last war in just a second, but one very interesting aspect of this. This individualist fervor, which is much in our collective discussion these days, in part because of uh, Patrick Deneen's work and the work of others, including Rod Dreher, although he, he doesn't really focus on this, but the notion that um, the American understanding of liberalism and, and freedom is intensely individualistic is not completely reflected in that First Amendment. And what I mean by that is, I think, encapsulated by the following. They considered a number of, wor a number of sets of words for that, for what became the First Amendment. They debated this. And one candidate was, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or I forget what the verb was, prohibiting or constricting, the rights of conscience. Now, given what I've said about this Protestant individualism, that would have been the most logical way to characterize what they saw as the content of religion, the rights of conscience. We still say that, we believe it, because it is constituent of religious freedom. But they did not put that in the First Amendment. They put the free exercise of religion. And my point is that this is not just about individuals, it's about groups as well. So I would argue that the American Revolution was necessary for that precious right that only in the United States has come to be associated with, the, or in, at least in my mind, and I hope in yours, with the right way to consider religious freedom. Not just an American invention, but a, an understanding of human nature and of the, necessi the necessity of religious freedom for political prosperity, to quote George Washington in his second farewell address. Final point, it's a reverse of the first. Our wars, and I may be uh, crossing over the past to the present here, I don't know, it depends on your meaning of the past, but the wars, the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq after 9-11, 2001, 2003, as Rod mentioned, they were expressly intended, or at least uh, verbally, that was one of the uh, certainly the Afghanistan invasion. You remember the forward strategy of freedom of President Bush, the notion that we have to implant democracy, including religious freedom in these countries, in order to drain the swamps of extremism. Well, I think it's not an overstatement to say it didn't work. 
And indeed, precisely the opposite has emerged, notwithstanding the fact that we managed to get religious freedom into the constitutions of both of those countries. They're there, read them, the constitutions of uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. They protect religious freedom. There's some problems with that, which I won't go into, some wording problems. But the point is, we thought we were, we were doing something that would undermine extremism, and it backfired. So I will leave you with the thought that, on balance, war, while sometimes it must be fought in defense of freedom and liberty, is a blunt and largely ineffective policy instrument for implanting the institutions and habits of freedom. There have to be cultural predicates, and if we're gonna get into this, the jargon phrase for what we do in this is post-conflict stabilization. There are whole offices and departments of defense and state that focus on post-conflict stabilization. If you're gonna do that, you have to engage the cultures, not simply the constitutional uh, representatives and the officials of the state, and that is very hard work. Thank you.